Professor Bailey. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, what, a, what an honor to be invited here, and what an honor to have so many of you here. Um, I'm, uh, does everybody have a copy of the handout? I think they were on the chairs. Um, the front page of the handout gives uh, an outline of what I'll be talking about, and the back page is really there just so you can tell that I'm a professor. <laughs> So I, I, there are references there. I always, when, especially when I'm presenting information that for some people is going to seem counterintuitive. It's going to seem to run counter to what many people believe. Then I really like to at least offer the opportunity for you to see some of the original sources, the data, the evidence that I'm talking about. So. The title of my talk today is Mother Nature's Pedagogy, Mother Nature's Way of Teaching. Uh, how children's natural curiosity, playfulness, and sociability serve their education. So I'm an evolutionary psychologist, um, which means that I'm interested in human nature. I'm interested in uh, how our human nature came about by natural selection. And I'm especially interested in the nature of human children. Why are children the way they are? Children all over the world are the same. They are curious, they're playful, they're willful. They come into the world with certain characteristics. And why do they come into the world with those characteristics? And my basic argument is today is that children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves. They have self-educative instincts. And, if all, and our job as educators is to allow those instincts to operate, to allow them to educate themselves. We turn things around. We use the term education for something that we do to children. We educate children. As if we are the active participants in the process. And the children are the passive participants in the process. They get educated. Education, the way we talk about it, is something that we do to children. And children get this thing that we give them. And what I'm going to argue is that's the wrong way to think about education. Education is something that children do for themselves. And they will do it if we don't stop them from doing it. And sadly, altogether too often in our schools, we stop them from doing it. Because we shut off the very processes that Mother Nature endowed them with for the purpose of education. So that's really my thesis. The children come into the world biologically designed to educate themselves, and we don't have to educate them. All we have to do is provide the conditions that allow them to educate themselves. So this is a very radical thesis from today's perspective. It would not have been regarded as radical at another time in another place. But it's from the way we think of it today, this is an unusual way to think about education. Let me begin by defining education. From a broad perspective, education really is cultural transmission. It's the process by which each new generation of human beings acquires the skills, the knowledge, the values, the lore, the beliefs of the previous generation and builds upon those. We have been the cultural animal for at least two million years. <laughs> Culture has been transmitted. That's what distinguishes us from the other animals, is that we are the animal that absolutely depends upon cultural transmission. In other words, it absolutely depends upon education. And this has been true for at least two million years. Schools have only been around for a couple of hundred years, at least only common for a couple of hundred years. So we can't think of education and schooling as the same thing. Education has been going on for two million years. Schooling has been going on for only a short time. 
And I'm actually going to argue that schools came about not for the purpose of education. They came about for a different purpose. But we now think of them as serving the purpose of education. So we have been the animal that passes culture along from generation to generation. And my argument is that the onus for that cultural transmission has always been with children, not with adults. Children come into the world and the only way they're going to survive and reproduce is if they can educate themselves, as if they can figure out what it is they have to learn in order to do well in the culture in which they're born. And this has been true for, for many, for hundreds of thousands of generations of human beings. So over the course of natural selection, it makes sense that children would have acquired basic instincts for educating themselves, basic instincts for figuring out what it is they have to learn and then going ahead and learning it. So now if you look at the handout, we're kind of at uh, A here, the educative instincts. What are these instincts? What are these characteristics that children, all children, all normal children come into the world with these very strong drives. So the first drive that I've listed here is curiosity. Children are by nature curious unless we drive the curiosity out of them. Aristotle in his great treatise on uh, the origin of knowledge, his metaphysica, the very first sentence of his treatise was Human beings are by nature curious. That was his first statement about human beings and how knowledge comes about. Human beings are by nature curious. Nothing could be truer. You look at any little child, almost as soon as they're born, they're exploring the world. They're figuring out what's around them. Even within hours of their birth, as soon as they can begin to see anything, they are now interested in new things. They see this and then you show them something else and they turn and they look at something else, they're trying to figure out the world around them. As soon as they can move, they're exploring with every possible way that they can explore. They're squeezing objects, they're dropping objects, they're figuring out what they can do with objects. They're constantly doing that. They're attuned to the people around them. They're trying to figure out the people around them. They are naturally doing that. They're picking up language. We don't have to teach children their native language. They pick it up. They pay attention to it. They absorb it. They are little learning machines. We can't stop them from learning unless we shut them away in closets. So children come into the world intensely, intensely curious. Children come into the world playful. The second characteristic I've listed here under educative instincts is playfulness. So curiosity is the drive to understand, the drive to figure out what's there and what can I do with it, what is the nature of the world around me. Playfulness is the drive to, to develop skills. Play, curiosity is how you acquire knowledge. Playfulness is how you acquire skills. Play is nature's way of ensuring that young mammals in general, but young human beings in particular, will practice the skills that they need to develop to become effective adults in the culture in which they are raised. Think of all the ways that children play, when children are free to play, when children have lots of time to play. They play in at all of the kinds of skills that are important for human beings to develop. They play in physical ways, and that's how they develop their physical bodies and how to move gracefully, and they develop strong hearts and lungs. They play in risky ways. They climb trees too high, and they swing high in swings, and they skateboard down banisters in our culture. They do all these risky things, and what are they doing when they do that? They're developing courage. They're practicing courage. They're practicing how to handle fear and control their body and their mind in a fearful state. All of us, at some point in our lives, are going to fear, are going to experience some real danger in our lives where we have to be able to manage fear. We have to be courageous. And so it's not surprising that in play, children practice that when we allow them to do it. They play with language. Listen, little children are acquiring language in a playful way. The very first cooing and babbling of babies everywhere 
is when they're in a playful mood. The first words of every language, in every language culture, the first words are always used in a playful context. The child isn't asking for anything. The child is playing with words. And as children grow older, they play in more sophisticated ways with language. They become little poets. They turn the language inside out. They, be, they develop rhymes and literation, and they begin to uh, play with the grammar. What would happen if I turned the grammar around? Listen to young children talk, and they are playing with the language. They play socially with other children. There's nothing that children want to do more than play with other children. Well, we are social animals. We have to know how to get along with one another. We have to know how to make friends. We have to know how to, know, know how to negotiate our differences. We have to know how to pay attention to other people and understand what their needs are. And that's what children are practicing all the time when they're playing with other children. They play at building things, constructive play. They play at whether they're building sand castles or they're building with blocks or they're building tree houses or whatever they're building. We are the animal with opposable thumbs. We're the animal that survives by building things. So it's not surprising that children play at building things. Everywhere in the world they do that when they're allowed to play to, to their heart's content. They play games with rules. We are the animal that has to abide by rules. Every human culture has rules. And children are practicing abiding by rules when they're playing games with rules. And in fact, when I talk specifically about play in my talk tomorrow, I'm going to argue that all play has rules. In some cases, the rules are implicit rather than explicit, but children are always practicing abiding by rules when they're playing games. They play imaginative games. Play is, always has at least some elements of imagination. Well, imagination is the key to all higher order human thinking. All of what we call advanced thinking involves imagination. It's the, the, our thought differs from that of other animals primarily in that we can imagine things. We can, we can talk about things that never happened. We can think of things that never happened. We can think of tomorrow. We, and the, tomorrow never happened because we can imagine what might happen tomorrow. We can think of alternative worlds. We can think of new inventions. We can think of things that are not immediately present. And children are always practicing that in the imaginative qualities of their play. Children play with logic, and I'll give some examples of that, uh, especially in my talk tomorrow. Children are in, in, when children are playing out a game, they're thinking, now what would have to happen next if this were to happen? And they're, still, they're thinking logically. And they play with the tools of their culture, and that depends upon what culture they're raised in. In our culture right now, children are playing with computers. Of course they are. Every child can look around and see that the primary tool of our culture today is the computer. So I better get good at computers. So of course they're going to play with computers. Children in hunter-gatherer cultures play with bows and arrows and digging sticks and knives and so on. Children in farming cultures play with agricultural equipment. They look around, they see what are the tools in my culture that I have to get good at, and they play at those things. Nobody has to tell them to do any of these things. They just do it naturally. We have to let them do it, though. We have to give them time and space and opportunity to do it, and that's how children educate themselves. When we, when we tell children what they have to do all the time, when we put them in schools and then after school they have to continue doing what they're being told to do, we are depriving them of all of this kind of play in which they are naturally designed to educate themselves in. So one of the ways, um, well, so that's, so that's play. A third characteristic, we're still now here on this list of educative instincts, the third characteristic that all normal children come into the world with is sociability. The strong drive to connect with other people, to make friends, to figure out what other people know, to want to be able to tell other people what you know. That's part of, that's part, uh, a basic part of being a human being. We are an intensely social species. We can't survive alone. We can only survive through our connections with other people. We all need help in order to survive. We all need the friendship and help of other people. We need to be able to cooperate with other people. Children, 
come into the world biologically drawn to other people. They want to learn what other people know, and that's one of their m most important educative instincts. The special characteristic that we have for learning from other people, which no other animal has, is language. We can hear from other people about their thoughts, about their experiences, about their beliefs about the future. And even very young children, as soon as they can understand language, they're paying attention to what other people are saying. And they want to hear, they want to learn from other people. We don't have to force them to learn from us. They want to learn from us. They listen to us, they absorb what we're talking about, they ask questions once they're able to ask questions, and the questions are meaningful to them when they're their own questions. They're, of course, not meaningful when there are questions and we're forcing questions upon them but they're meaningful to the child when it's the child's questions that are being asked. The philosopher uh, Daniel Dennett once pointed out that, um, you know, let me just read this quote from him about the value of language. He says, comparing our brains with bird brains or dolphin brains is almost beside the point because our brains are in effect joined together by a single cognitive system that dwarfs all others. They are joined by an innovation that has invaded our brain and no other's language. So the fact that all children learn language, essentially all children learn language naturally, and then they're using language to educate themselves. They're, pay, they're, they're listening to what people are saying, they're asking questions, they're engaging in conversation. So let me illustrate how these first three characteristics interact with one another in children's uh, education. And I'll illustrate it with an example of, uh, that comes from the work of Sugata Mitra. How many of you know, how many of you know of Sugata Mitra's work in India? Um, this was a number of years ago, actually it was in the 1990s, late 1990s and up to about the year 2000. And he, he at that time was the uh, education director at a at a, uh, an Institute of Technology in New Delhi. And the building that he worked in faced one of the worst slums of New Delhi. And there were street children who weren't going to school, who were illiterate, uh, out there. He thought, he wondered what would happen if I made a computer available to them. This was at a time when, before most people had computers, before certainly these children in India had never seen a computer before. So what he did was to make a hole in the wall of the building and he installed a computer there, kind of a solid enough computer that it was, wasn't, it couldn't be easily destroyed. And all he did is he went out and he told the kids on the street, you can play with it. He didn't tell them what to do with it, he didn't tell them what it was, he just said you can play with it. And what he discovered was that within days, these children had figured out how to use the computer. They came and explored the computer. They figured out how to use it. Within not too long, he said, there were at least 300 children who now were computer literate. Nobody had taught them a thing about the computer. They had learned it all entirely themselves. Now, let me bring the three characteristics of children to bear on how that learning occurred. So they came, they saw this strange object. It looked a little bit like a television set. That's probably the only thing they could relate it to. And they were told they could play with it, so they came and explored it. They were curious about it. They tried doing various things with it. This is what children naturally do. They try various things with objects to see what you can do with this object. And in the process, they discovered that they could open up, they, they found that, that by moving their hand on a trackpad, they could get, um, a marker on the screen to move. Wow, look at that. And then they found that if they clicked at a certain point, something would happen on the screen. They discovered over time, they discovered, for example, the Met Paint program and a drawing program, and they downloaded games and so on and so forth. That was, the, that was curiosity. Curiosity led them to do that. But then once they they, once they had kind of figured out what they could do with it, then they began to play with it. So they would be play with the paint program. They would make pictures with the paint program. Or they would play with games that they downloaded. They would even just play at downloading stuff. What, kind of, what kinds of things can I download? What can I get here? 
So curiosity led them to discover what the computer can do. Playfulness led them to become skilled at using the computer. And sociability is what led one person's discovery to be everybody's discovery. So the children didn't play one at a time at the computer. The children would group around the computer and one person would discover something and then everybody would see it and then everybody wanted to do it. And so there might be a group of say 10 or 11 kids. Maybe they would be range in age from 5 to 10 or 5 to 12. And they would all be excited about what they discovered and then one of them would have a friend maybe in another group and he would go and tell the other group about that and then they would come and do it. So the knowledge that was discovered spread like wildfire through the whole community of children. And what, um, what Mitra claims is that for, he then went on to set up other computers in various other parts of India. And what he claims is that for every computer that he set up and made available, another 300 kids on average would become computer literate. And some of them began to learn other things by use of the computer. Some of them were downloading stuff. Some of them were learning to read at the computer because there were words on the screen. Some of them were downloading, some of them who could read somewhat were finding, art, finding things to download that they would read. They all learned how, of course, to download games and music and the kinds of things that children everywhere download when they have access to a computer. So Mitra's experiment, Mitra's, uh, demonstration really shows how these three basic characteristics of human beings, curiosity, playfulness, and sociability, can come together to produce remarkably rapid and efficient learning. But now I've listed two other characteristics here. Willfulness, which is the drive to be in charge of your own life. You could call, almost call this the freedom drive. We all want to be free. We're all sociable, we want to be connected to other people, but we don't want to be controlled by other people. We don't want to be told what to do by other people. None of us do. We hate that. We like to make our own choices. We might like advice from other people, but we want to, in the end, decide whether to follow that advice or not. And that's as true for children as it is for adults. That's true of people everywhere in the world. You want to be in charge of your own life. That's part of the educative drive. Every child knows, ultimately, I've got to be responsible for my life. And I want to start, even as a child, being responsible for my own life, to the degree that it's possible for me to be so. So this willfulness, this, this feeling like, yes, I want to explore, but I want to explore what I want to explore, not what somebody else wants to make me explore. I want to play, but I want to play at what I want to play at, not what somebody else wants me to play at. I want to socialize, but I want to socialize with whom I want to socialize, not with, so, with whom somebody else is making me socialize. Children, by nature, have this independence streak in them. And if we quash that independence, then we create dependent children, dependent human beings, rather than people who can ultimately take charge and responsibility of their own life as they go through it. And a fourth characteristic that I've, a fifth characteristic I've listed here really is planfulness. This is a somewhat later and slower developing characteristic. The young child isn't necessarily, the little child isn't necessarily planful, at least on a long-term basis, although even little children are planning ahead to some extent. So this ability that we have to think ahead, to think about tomorrow, to think about even just an hour ahead, so children begin to develop plans. And as they get older, they begin to think about their future. They begin to think about what is it that I want to do with my life. That's part of the educative instinct. Somehow I have to take charge of my own life. I'm not going to always be fed by somebody. I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to get food, how I'm going to do the things, how I'm going to attract a mate if I ever want to have children. They have to make plans and figure out how they're going to do that. And then education becomes a little bit more consciously directed, a little more consciously self-directed. If I want to do this, then I have to learn this, and so let me do that. And what I've observed is when children are free, they do that. They figure out what it is they need to learn to live the kind of life that they want to live. So I'm arguing that these five drives are part of human nature 
which all serve the function of education if we allow those drives to serve the function of education. So now I want to, one way that I have explored um, these educative drives is to look at how education occurs in hunter-gatherer cultures. So it's quite natural as an evolutionary psychologist I would be interested in hunter-gatherer cultures because throughout the great bulk, at least 99% of our evolution uh, as human beings, we were hunter-gatherers. So the instincts that I'm talking about would have come about during our hunter-gatherer days. And so it's interesting to know how those instincts serve the function of education within a hunter-gatherer culture. So I began to try to read, look up what had been written, and not a whole lot had been written. There's a lot of anthropologists who studied hunter-gatherer cultures, but most of them were focused on adults, and there wasn't a lot of writing about children. There was some writing about children and the relationship between adults and children. And I read all of that, which was very interesting, but then I decided I needed to do a study uh, by interviewing uh, anthropologists who had actually lived in such cultures and asking them what they observed about children, what were children doing, what was the relationship like between children and adults, how did children learn the things they have to learn in the cultures that, um, that they observed. So as you probably know, you know, we were all hunter-gatherers until about 10 or 11,000 years ago. And then in some parts of the world, agriculture came about, and gradually in other parts of the world, agriculture came about. But there are still, even today, there are a few traces of hunter-gatherer cultures left. Um, there are no hunter-gatherer cultures that I know of today that are really, you could say, pristine hunter-gatherer cultures. They've all been affected in various ways by uh, other people who, by, by other people who, uh, from more modern civilizations who have been interacting with them. But as recently as the middle uh, 20th century, uh, even the period from about 1950 to about 1980 or so, anthropologists could trek out to various uh, remote parts of the world where you could find people still living in the hunter-gatherer kind of way. And the, the, the second half of the 20th century was a big period for that kind of research. And so a few years ago, one of my graduate students and I um, identified 10 anthropologists, I'm sorry, seven anthropologists, who among them, I'm sorry, yeah, no, it was, it was 10 anthropologists who among them had studied seven different hunter-gatherer groups on three different continents. And we asked them about life in the group that they studied. Now, one thing I should say, there are certain things about hunter-gatherer, no matter where you're looking at them, there are certain commonalities among these hunter-gatherer groups. These are all band, band uh, um, societies. In other words, they live in small bands of uh, ranging from about 20 to 50 people, including children, per band. Each band is autonomous, independent of other bands. There's no higher government over them. They are uh, nomadic in the sense that they move around a sort of uh, loose territory following the game and available vegetation. So that means that they don't own much. There's no point in owning more than you can carry on your back. And they build little temporary villages wherever they go, and then they simply, with huts, and then they simply move on, and they may have a set of different campsites that they rotate around. Another name that anthropologists use for band hunter-gatherers is egalitarian cultures, because these are the only societies that are known that are truly egalitarian. There's no leader, there's no big man, there's no chief. There's nobody in charge. They make all their decisions by consensus, by discussion. They, their highest uh, value is sharing. You have to share everything. It would be wrong for one person to have more than another. They share their food. They share anything that they have. That's the value of the culture. Now, part of this, this egalitarianism is that you never act like you are above somebody else. You never act like you know more than somebody else, that you're more worthy than somebody else. 
And part of that is you don't tell other people what to do to a level that almost seems ridiculous to some of us in our society. And they don't even tell children what to do. I heard this, the first time I heard this, it was hard for me to believe. But they don't even tell children what to do. They believe that every child has his own free agent. And although they're very interested in what children do, they don't believe that they have any, uh, that, that it's any part of their job to control what children do. So let me, um, so there were really three conclusions about children's lives that came out of this, uh, this study of, uh, of hunter-gatherers. The first conclusion is what I've just said, that adults do not direct children's uh, activities. Let me just to illustrate that, let me read three quotations. I've got a whole set of such quotations, but here's just three of them from three different observers of three different hunter-gatherer uh, cultures. So here's one who writes, hunter-gatherers do not give orders to their children. For example, no adult announces bedtime. At night, children remain around adults until they feel tired and fall asleep. Adults do not interfere with their children's lives. They never beat, scold, or behave aggressively with them physically or verbally nor do they offer praise or keep track of their development. They just assume that the kids are going to grow up okay. They don't praise, they don't criticize. Praise, in a sense, is just the opposite. It's sort of the other side of criticism. It's almost as bad as criticism, because if somebody's doing something for praise, they're doing something because you are trying to control what they're doing. That's the, that's the sense in which praise is as bad as criticism. So here's another quotation. The idea that this is my child or your child does not exist. Deciding what another person should do, no matter what his age, is outside the Yaquana vocabulary of behaviors. There is great interest in what everyone does, but no impulse to influence, let alone coerce anyone. The child's will is his motive force. This was an observer of a group called the Yaquana in the Amazon. And here's one more. Infants and young children are allowed to explore their environment to the limits of their physical capacities and with minimal interference from adults. Thus, if a child picks up a hazardous object, parents generally leave it to explore the dangers on its own. The child is presumed to know what it is doing. One of my colleagues at Boston College actually uh, lived with and studied a, a group called the EFE, a hunter-gathered group called the EFE in Central Africa in the 1980s. And she has slides of little toddlers, two-year-olds, playing with machetes, playing with fire, adults sitting back in the background not paying any attention to this. And I asked her, well, don't the adults worry that the children will cut themselves or that they'll burn themselves? And she said, and, and she said, they really don't worry about it, and sometimes the children do burn themselves or cut themselves, but they never injure themselves in a very serious way, and nobody really worries that much about it. You get a little burn and you've learned something. You get a little cut and you've learned something as a result in it. And so then I kind of persisted. I said, well, even so, if they hurt themselves, why do they let, why do they let the, the kids do it? And she said, they would give you two responses to that. The first response, the first reason they let the kids do it is they would say, how else are the children going to learn how to use these things? And the earlier they learn to use these things, the better. They become essentially an extension of the child's own body when they're beginning to use these tools at such an early age. So they would recognize the learning value of using these real tools of the culture, even if they're somewhat dangerous. And the second reason they would give is that what right do I have to stop my child? If my child wants to do it, that's his choice. Let him do it. Now, don't, don't get the impression from this that these are negligent parents. The poison darts are kept way out of reach. The things that could really kill the child are kept way out. No two-year-old would be playing with poison darts because they recognize that a two-year-old might make a mistake and, and, and uh, poke himself with that dart and would die as a result. But they make a different judgment than we make about what's safe and what's not safe and the, and the relative risk of doing some of one thing versus another. 
The second thing that I learned from this part of my study was that children, including teenagers, have essentially unlimited time to play and explore. Nobody expects children, even teenagers, to do much work. That surprised me. I thought maybe the kids would be expected to do a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of work, but they, they don't. And there's two reasons why not. One is, again, they believe that children, that people should do what they want to do, and it's only when you feel like you really want to start working and contributing to culture, and everybody eventually does want to do that. So they wouldn't order somebody to do something they don't want to do, and children just naturally want to play with other children and explore and do those kinds of things. And another reason is because they recognize that children need huge amounts of time to play, explore, socialize in order to develop the skills that they need to become effective adults. Just as I said at the beginning, these are the instincts that allow children to acquire the culture, to become educated, and hunter-gatherer adults apparently recognize this. So they understand that children need essentially full time to play and explore. One of the questions that I asked in that survey of the anthropologist was, for the children that you observed and the culture that you observed, how much time every day were they free to play on their own? And essentially the answer was all the time. So here's just a couple of quotes. Both girls and boys had almost all day, every day, free to play. And here's another quote from a different group. Children were free to play all the time. No one expected children to do serious work until they were in their late teens. This happened to be Karen Endicott concerning the Betak of Indonesia. So here we've got a culture where adults are not ordering children around. They're not scolding children. They're certainly not beating children. They're not scolding children. They're not nagging children. They're letting children do what they want to do. And what the children want to do is play, and that's just fine, and that's what the, that's what the children do, and that's how they grow up. Now, in their exploration, the third thing that I found is that in their exploration and play, children acquire the knowledge and practice the skills that are essential for success in their culture. So children play in all the kinds of ways, those ways that I listed at the beginning of the talk. Children in hunter-gatherer cultures are playing in all of those ways. And as a result of playing in those ways, they are acquiring all of those kinds of skills that people have to acquire in every culture. But they are also, because they're playing in the context of a particular culture, they're playing with the tools and with the skills that they see are especially important to learn in their culture. So one of the things that um, uh, one of the things I asked in the survey was, what are some of the things you saw the children playing at? And when I looked at the lists that people gave me of the activities that they saw children playing at, what stood out is that very frequently they were listing activities that are important activities to learn in the culture that they're growing up in. So here's an example of the things that were listed. Digging up tubers, fishing, smoking porcupines out of holes, cooking, caring for infants, climbing trees, building vine ladders, building huts, using knives and other tools, making tools, carrying heavy loads, building rafts, making fires, defending against attacks from pretend predators, Imitating animals, which would be a means of learning to identify animals, very important in that culture. Um, making music, dancing, storytelling. All of these cultures have sort of rich music and dancing and so on, and children would, would engage in those activities. They'd make musical instruments and play musical instruments. Um, and, um, and, many, and some of the anthropologists said that they would playfully argue and that's interesting to me because, remember, this is a, these are cultures that make decisions by consensus. Sitting around the fire at night, the gr whole group decides when it's time to move on and if there's going to be any rules for the society, they make those. So the ability to get your point across without antagonizing other people is very, very important in that culture. And some of the anthropologists said that the children would deliberately practice that. They would. So in, in one of the cultures, the children would build, whenever the adults built a, a new little village, a temporary village of huts, the children would build a play village some distance away, out of earshot and eyeshot of the um, main village. 
And they would rehearse, they would practice what they saw around the fire the night before. And if some adult had been particularly ineffective in arguing, they would mock that adult. They would be even more ineffective. They would get even angrier than he got angry. And they would then all be hysterically laughing at that clownish adult who couldn't make a, a, who couldn't argue in an effective way. And then they would sort of practice arguing in a more effective way. You know, perfect kind of practice of a skill that's very important in that culture. And here's what I have to keep reminding you of. Nobody's telling them to do that. Nobody is instructing them to do it. Nobody's praising them for do it, doing it. They are doing it because they see this is something that's important in the culture that we are growing up in. And that's, that's true of all of, their, all of their play. Not surprisingly, the boys in these cultures played endlessly at hunting and tracking. Tracking is extremely difficult. Hunting is extremely difficult with the means that they have to hunt. And so it takes an enormous amount of practice. And they would practice in continuously at that. Uh, the one culture in which women also hunt, the Agta of the Philippines, women also hunt. In that culture, not surprisingly, the girls also played endlessly at tracking and hunting right along with the boys. So apparently what happens when you're born in a hunter-gatherer culture is you pay attention to what the people in your culture are doing and you begin to, you play at those activities. You play at the activities that you know you've got to be good at to become an effective adult in that culture. All right, now at this point, we have to ask the question, um, what happened? What changed? How did we go from this world where children were free, learned in their own way, played, explored, were joyful? The other thing I can say that, I, that essentially every one of these anthropologists said was that children were remarkably happy. They were remarkably well adjusted. You would never see anything like depression or, or anxiety in a child. One of the anthropologists said, these were the brightest children I've ever met in my life and also the most friendly children I've ever met in my life. They're not spoiled kids, even though you would think that this sounds like they're spoiling the kids because they're letting the kids do what they want to do. But these are not spoiled kids. These are kids who are growing up in an environment where you wouldn't survive if you, if you didn't know how to take care of yourself. There's, they're, they're, at minimum, they've got bug bites, they've got diseases, and so on and so forth. And they have to be tough and resilient to survive all of that. And the argument is that part of what they're learning in play is how to do that, how to be, how to be resilient, how to take care of yourself, how to deal with difficulties, and to deal with difficulties with good cheer rather than with constant complaining. One of, uh, I, was, I once gave a talk um, about um, hunter-gatherers to a group, and a, and a young woman who was a graduate student uh, came up to me afterwards, and she said, I'm studying whining. And I have this theory that children all over the world whine in the same way. And I'm wondering if the hunter-gatherer children um, whine in this way. And then she showed me how, voiced how whining sounds. And so I said, well, I don't know. That's not something I asked. I've never lived in a hunter-gatherer culture. I don't know. So I went, when I went back to Boston College, I asked my friend Gilda Morelli. She's the one who had studied the F.A. I said, what does an F.A. child's whine sound like? And she thought for a minute, and she said, you know, I lived with the F.A. for what amounted to about a full year. I saw all these children. I never saw a child whine. I never saw a child whine. It's almost unbelievable, and yet this seems to be, this seems to be the way that children through most of human history were growing up. So what happened? What happened is agriculture. Agriculture came along and it changed the way that people have to live. It certainly led to some improvements. We now had a more steady supply of food. You didn't have to depend so much on uh, the natural world. It allowed people to be more sedentary, which had its good things, but it also had the harm of it. You could now begin to accumulate wealth. And now, once you're a farmer, you have to own the property that you live on. You now have property ownership. 
And once you've got property ownership, you now have distinctions between those people who own the property and those people who don't own the property. And the people who don't own the property are now dependent on the people who own the property. And so now you go from what was an egalitarian environment to a hierarchical environment, where some people are in charge. The people who own the property can profit by hiring at low wages or by enslaving other people to work on their farm. You also begin to have bigger families. Hunter-gatherers have very small families because with that way of life and you're very lean and they're nursing each child for about three years and when you're lean and nursing you don't ovulate until uh, that finally wean that, that last child, that, the previous child, so births are spread out. People don't have big families. In the farming community, they began to have bigger families. People had put on more weight, they, 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 and they didn't nurse as long, and so people began to have big families. You now had the situation where you needed, because you had bigger families, you needed your children to work the farm. <laughs> You needed children to help with the farming. You needed the older children to help take care of the younger children. You now couldn't just let the children play and explore. But you also now were in a world, and as this spread along, we eventually reached, you know, to reach the pinnacle of this, we, came, we reached feudalism, feudalism throughout Europe and throughout Asia, where only a few people essentially owned all the land. And everybody was more or less a servant or a slave. Essentially, everybody was a servant or a slave. Well, if you're going to raise a child to be a servant or a slave, you're not going to foster the child's free will. It would be dangerous for a child who's going to be a servant or a slave to have free will. You've got to teach that child to be obedient. The entire education system, if you will, beginning within the family, was to teach obedience. Because to not be obedient, to question authority, could be your destruction. You don't question the Lord and manner. And so the way you teach the child is to teach the child, you're not allowed to question me, the parent. You're not allowed, you have to do exactly what I do and don't question it. Do it because I said it. That became the standard means of parenting. And the standard way of enforcing it was beating the child if the child didn't obey you. And even the Bible tells you to beat your child if the child doesn't obey you. That's the primary child-rearing advice of the Bible, to be honest. And that what came out of this kind of awful human history where most of us were slaves or servants and we were raising people not to be free, independent individuals, but to be slaves or servants. And the point that I want to make is that schooling came out of that history. Schools as we know them today emerged out of that. Even when we began to industrialize, we still had this hierarchical situation. Now the factories were owned by some people, and they could profit by, by having people work in those factories, and even children had to work in the factories. And you had to get children to suppress their free will. So to the hunter-gatherer, free will is a good thing. After hunter-gatherer period, free will is a bad thing. And so suppressing free will became the goal of education. It became the stated goal of education, not just the, the secondary result of education, but the actual stated goal of education. Let me give, um, let me give an example of that. So the, the first um, area in Europe where schools really, be, compulsory education really became common was in Prussia, the German state of Prussia. In the 17th century, mid-17th, late 17th century, and into the 18th century, the person who was most responsible for organizing the compulsory school system was a pietist uh, priest um, who, I don't wanna, who, whose name was, whose last name was, whose name was August Frankie. Now, Frankie's view of education was, um, let me just get my notes here. Frankie was very clear on, his, on the purpose of education. Part of the purpose of education was to teach children to read because they were in a society where many people didn't know how to read. And they believed that it was very important to be able to read the Bible, that everybody, these were, these were among the, this was during the Protestant Reformation period. 
And everybody believed within this movement that it was important for people to be able to read the Bible, not to get it secondarily from the priest, as you would if you were a Catholic, but to read the Bible directly. So, the, so part of the purpose of schooling was to teach children to read, but even more important than that was to teach children to believe unquestioningly the words of the Bible. It was not to teach critical thinking, it was not to teach creativity, it was to teach dogma, the dogmatic belief in the Bible. But the most important thing was to teach obedience. And Frankie was absolutely clear about that. Here's a quote in, in his manual for schoolmasters. Above all, it is necessary to break the natural willfulness of the child, while the schoolmaster who seeks to make the child more learned is to be commended, and more learned, by the way, meant memorizing more verses of the Bible, is to be commended he has not done enough. He has forgotten his most important task, namely that of making the will obedient. So whereas hunter-gatherers fostered the child's will, schools were developed explicitly to break the child's will. That was the purpose of them. And later on he wrote, youth do not know how to regulate their lives and are naturally inclined toward idle and sinful behavior. What a different view from the view of hunter-gatherers when left to their own devices. For this reason, it is a rule in this institution that a pupil never be allowed out of the presence of a supervisor. The supervisor's presence will stifle the pupil's in inclination to sinful behavior and slowly weaken his willfulness. So that's where, if you were to walk into one of Frankie's schools, you would have recognized it because it was basically like school today. Children in rows, children with the teacher up in front or the schoolmaster up in front, children learning lessons that they would then feed back to the teacher. The punishment then was more harsh. You might be beaten if you'd got things wrong, but we still have punishment today, low grades, shame, comparing to other people. You're not as good as other people, the implication is. The idea of learning being forced by reward and punishment rather than your own interests. The idea that obedience, even today, in every standard school that I know of, the, the route to success is unquestioned obedience. If you do what you're told to do, and you do it the way you're told to do it, and you don't question that, you will pass. <laughs> if you don't do what you're told to do, or you continuously question it, or you do it in some entirely different way that the teacher doesn't even understand, you will likely fail. Even today, the primary requirement for passing in school is obedience, unquestioned obedience. You don't ask the question, why are we learning this? <laughs> You just say, okay, this is what I have to learn. And in fact, schools could not deal with that question. If everybody was asking that, and you, and you tried to deal with it honestly, you couldn't have a school that's anything like the schools we have today. So the point I really want to make is schools were set up for a particular purpose, to suppress free will, to teach doctrine, and the way you teach doctrine is get people to memorize stuff and feed it back and make sure that they feed it back in the correct way. And schools were designed for that. If you were to design schools, let's say, to teach creativity or to teach critical thinking or to, or to ex allow curiosity to grow, they couldn't possibly look anything like the schools we have today because you couldn't possibly have those things in these schools. You can't possibly expect all children, if you've got... 20 or 30 or 40 children all together, you couldn't possibly expect that they're all going to be doing the same thing because they all want to do it. They're going to all be doing entirely different things. You couldn't possibly manage it in anything that looks like school today, anything that looks like school. So I think it's really important to understand that we are stuck right now. Throughout the world, we are stuck with a kind of school that was built for a purpose that's no longer the primary purpose of education in most enlightened educators' minds. Most people who go into teaching don't say, I'm going into teaching to break children's wills. They don't say, I'm going into teaching to teach dogma. They are more likely to say, I want to teach critical thinking. I want to expand children's curiosity. 
I want to do all those things, but they're stuck with a system that was designed for a different purpose. And you're just beating your head against the wall altogether too often. You can do the best you can within that system, but the best you can is not very good because the system isn't designed to allow for creativity, to allow for critical thinking, to allow curiosity to develop. So that's, so what, what would happen if we, if we tried out the hunter-gatherer system in our culture? Now, I think it's a legitimate argument for somebody who's first thinking about this to believe, well, the hunter-gatherer system was all very fine and good for hunter-gatherers. But we aren't hunter-gatherers. Our world is very different today from the hunter-gatherer world. Maybe our children are still born with those same instincts. But those instincts are good for learning hunter-gatherer stuff. But they wouldn't be good, let's say, for learning how to read or write or do numbers. Hunter-gatherer cultures are, are, don't, are not literate cultures. They don't have written languages. And they're not numerate cultures. They don't do much with arithmetic or math. And some of the cultures don't even have number words beyond one, two, and many. So what we think of as school is learning to read and write and do arithmetic. Um, right for starters there, these are things that hunter-gatherer kids don't have to learn because it's not part of the culture. And so it's a legitimate argument to think, well, maybe, maybe those hunter-gatherer instincts wouldn't work for learning to read and write and do numbers and do some of the other things that are important in our culture today. And there's also another difference between our culture and a hunter-gatherer culture. Hunter-gatherer culture, it's a small band you're growing up in. You can see what all the adults are doing. It's easy to see what's going on. So this method of looking and observing and playing at the kinds of things that you, you see, it's pretty easy to see how that might work in a hunter-gatherer culture. It's less easy to see how that might work in our culture. So all of that would lead me to think, well, maybe the hunter-gatherer system of education might not work in our culture. It would lead me to think that were it not for the fact that I've seen evidence to the contrary, I've seen evidence that the hunter-gatherer system can work beautifully in our culture if we provide the right conditions for it to work. It doesn't work just naturally. We have to provide the right conditions for it. And so that's the, kind, that's the research that I've done at, um, the primary place that I've done this research is, is at a school called the Sudbury Valley School that's in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, and some years ago, I got very much interested in this school and began to do research there. And it really, that's really where my, um, my orientation towards education just got turned upside down. I was very much a believer in the traditional system of schooling. I was a product of that system of schooling. Uh, my parent, my mother was a teacher. I grew up in, a, I still have a sister who's a teacher and so on in a regular school. So I was just amazed by what I observed at this particular school called the Sudbury Valley School. So let me describe this school. This school was not set up with the idea that we're going to emulate a hunter-gatherer band. It was set up with an entirely different idea in mind. It was set up by people who are strong believers in democracy. And they believe that if, uh, if, you're, if you're raising children in a democracy, as America purports to be, then you want to raise children in a democratic environment. So they will grow up experiencing all the rights and privileges and the obligations of being a citizen in a democracy. So they said, we're going to create a school which is essentially a little democracy in which the students of whatever age they are are full citizens of this democracy. They have the full power of vote on everything that happens. That was the basic idea. And they are allotted all the rights of democracy. So supposedly the rights, the inalienable rights, if you will, of a, dem of, of a democratic people are the right of free speech, the right of free association, associate with whom you choose, the right of trial by jury. If you're accused of something, you should have the opportunity to defend yourself. There's a, the due process this is called. 
the right to choose your own path to happiness, the right to decide your own fate, the right to control your life. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, you should have the right to do what you want to do, as long as you're not hurting other people in the process. So they said, let's have a school that ensures all of these rights. And a school in which it's not a it's not an anarchy, it's a school of law, but all the laws, the rules are going to be made by a democratic system in which every participant in the school, whether you're four years old or 15 years old or a, a 70 year old staff member, everybody has the same vote. So the, so the school is, it's a day school. It now has about 170 students who range in age from four on through uh, what would be high school age if they were someplace else. Uh, four through about 17, 18, sometimes 19 years old. Um, there are seven staff members, so there's not a whole lot of adults there compared to the number of children. Uh, and, it's, and the school building itself is an old Victorian farmhouse and a, and a barn that's been fashioned to uh, have uh, music rooms and, um, and other rooms within it. There's a pond on the property, there's a nice field, they're adjacent to a wood. The school is governed democratically by the school meeting, so all the rules of the school are made at the school meeting by one person, one vote. Every person, whether they're a staff member or a child, has just one vote in making the rules. The, um, the, the uh, school and the educational philosophy of the school is essentially that of a hunter-gatherer band. The educational philosophy is there's no curriculum here that's being enforced. Children are on their own. They can learn whatever they want to learn in whatever ways, and they don't even have to learn anything. That's their responsibility. That's not our responsibility. There's a lot of things to do here, but they, we're not going to make them do any of it. They can just do whatever they want, as long as they're following the democratically made rules. It's as radically different as you can imagine from our typical schools. Most people would think this couldn't possibly work. Yet this school was founded in 1968, almost half a century ago, almost 50 years ago. It's been going on ever since. It now has hundreds of graduates who are out there in the real world. So my first study of the school was a study of the graduates of the school quite some years ago. But already at that time, there were many graduates, and some of them had done all of what would have been their kindergarten through high school education at this school. And I, and I was able to, ident to, to locate almost all of the graduates, and I looked at what they had done with their life after leaving. And I was really quite amazed. They, those who wanted to go on to higher education didn't seem to have any difficulty getting into college and doing well in college. Those who, many of those who didn't go on to higher education had wonderful careers that don't require college. They were almost entirely talked about the happiness of their lives. They were in careers that they enjoyed. They were satisfied with life. Um, they would, now this wasn't a comparative study, so I can't say precisely how they would compare, but here were these kids, these young people, and, and some of them now were older than young people. Um, they were living very well in the United States without having done anything that looked like school when they were in kindergarten through what would be kindergarten through 12th grade elsewhere. I then began to uh, get interested in how they learn and that's really what led me to the study of play and exploration and how children learn when they are free to do what they want to do and I'll be talking more about that in my talk tomorrow. But what I want to do now is to describe, if you're looking at the, if you're still following on the handout, we're now down, I'm going to skip E, we're now down to F, the optimal context for self-directed education. What I've listed here is six characteristics that I think are similar between the Sudbury Valley School and a hunter-gatherer band. These, I believe, are the conditions that optimize children's abilities to use their educative instincts to educate themselves. And as I go through this list, what I want you to think about is the fact that none of these characteristics exist in our standard schools. 
It says, if we take away in our standard schools all of the conditions that children need in order to educate themselves, and then we very inefficiently and very ineffectively try to educate them using reward and punishment rather than their own natural learning instincts. So the first characteristic that I've listed here is the social expectation and reality that education is children's responsibility. Children come into the world believing it's their responsibility. Every young child is already a set on educating himself or herself. But at some point, we take that responsibility away from the child. We say, do what we tell you to do. Do the things we tell you to do and you will become educated. And that's essentially telling the child, I'm in charge of your education rather than you being in charge of your education. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that the child gives up the sense of responsibility for his own education and begins to think, okay, I just have to do what I'm told to do. So that's the first criterion, that there not be any pretense that adults are educating you. Simply under, continue with the idea that this is my job to educate myself. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is unlimited freedom to play, explore, and pursue one's own interests. Not an hour a day for this, not two hours a day, not three hours a day, essentially all the time. You need time. If you're going to educate yourself through curiosity, you need time to Try different things. You need time to dabble at this and dabble at that. You need time to get bored. Time to apparently do nothing until you can't stand being bored anymore. And then you try to do, then you, and then it sort of stirs your soul. And then you finally find something to do that interests you. Time to find what really is your passion. And then once you've found that, time to really delve into it. You can't really develop a passionate interest if every time the bell rings, you have to drop it and go to something else. You need time to immerse yourself in what it is that you love to do. One of the things that I found in the study of graduates of Sudbury Valley is many of them were pursuing careers in the very activity that they had immersed themselves in as children. And I could give many examples of that. But just as one example, there was one, one uh, woman who was captain of a cruise ship. This was her dream job. As a little girl, she had played with boats in the pond, and she became fascinated with boats. She learned all about boats, and she, by the time she was a teenager, she apprenticed herself to a ship captain. And so by the time she was ready to leave the school, she was practically ready for her dream job of being captain of a ship herself. And I could go through many such examples of that. I would say that about half the graduates of the school were pursuing careers where there was a very direct line between what they had discovered that they really loved to do in play as children and what they were now doing as adults for their career. And they would tell me, I'm still playing. I'm doing what I love to do, and now I'm making my living doing it. What a happy life that is to be able to do that. So unlimited freedom to play, explore, pursue your own end. Third characteristic, opportunity to play with the tools of the culture. Remember I said those hunter-gatherer kids, they're playing with fire, they're playing with knives, they're playing with bows and arrows, they're doing creative things, they're be really learning how to use these tools because they're allowed to experiment with them and play with them. In our culture, computers are the main tool, but at Sudbury Valley there's, there's tools for cooking, there's tools for there's sporting equipment, there's woodworking equipment, there's photography equipment, there are various kinds of tools that are important to our culture. And the children, once they demonstrate the basics of how to use the tool so they're not going to break the tool or really hurt themselves with it, then they're free to play with it in whatever way they want, as long as, they're, as, long as they do it in a way that isn't um, going to ru ruin this, this object that they're playing with. So you need to have the tools of the culture, you need to have access to those tools of the culture, and those need to be readily available so that you can play with them whenever you wish. Fourth characteristic, access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. That part is so important, helpers, not judges. Because if somebody is my judge, if somebody is determining whether I pass or fail, or whether I get an A or a B or a C or a D or an F, or get a gold star or don't get any star, 
then I'm not likely to admit my weaknesses to that person. I'm more likely to go into impression management with that person. I'm more likely to be in a mode of showing that person how wonderful I am and good I am, not likely to go and admit my weaknesses and ask for help at things that I really am not very good at. So the idea, and, and what, whenever you're feeling judged, it makes you feel nervous. And it's very hard to learn when you're feeling nervous. So this is an environment where there's no reason to feel nervous because nobody's judging you. The staff members are like kindly uncles and aunts. They're, your, they're cheering you on. They wanna, they're glad to help you, but they're not pushing themselves on you. They're just glad to help you if you go with them. And they're, they're cheering you. They're not judging you. They're not deciding whether you passed or failed. They're not deciding whether what you've done is adequate or inadequate. If you go and ask them, you know, so what do you think of this essay I wrote? And they'll say, well, do you want my honest opinion? And, and yeah, I want your honest opinion. And they'll give their honest opinion. So if you're asking for help of that sort, they'll give it but they won't volunteer it. They don't come and say, I want to see a, 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 an essay that you've written so that I can judge it. So the fifth characteristic, and this is what I'm going to be talking about in the workshop this evening, so I'm not going to elaborate it on it today, but I think this is the most important characteristic, free age mixing among children and adolescents. One of the worst things we do in our schools and in our society generally is segregate children by age. Throughout human history, children always played in age-mixed groups, and younger children always learned from older children in the context of play. And older children learned how to be mature and responsible and leaders by helping younger children. This was part of growing up throughout human history, and now we've made that so difficult because we segregate children by age. We don't have as big families as we used to have, so even within the family there's not a big spread of ages and we don't have extended families the way we used to have, and in schools children are segregated, and increasingly even out of schools, children are put in age-segregated groups out of school. So in the workshop I'm going to be talking about um, the value of age mixing. This, the person who founded Sudbury Valley School has long said that age mixing is the key to how education works in this kind of a setting. If everybody was the same age, or you segregated children by age, it wouldn't learn. It wouldn't work. Kids wouldn't learn anything. Because the younger kids are learning so much from the older kids, and the older kids are learning so much by, by, uh, by the fact that the younger kids are around them. Uh, and then the sixth characteristic I've listed here is immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. I think this is, this is, I used to omit that one. I used to talk about just five characteristics. But the more I think about it, the more I think that's a, an important part of it. Immersion in a, in a stable, moral, democratic community. A hunter-gatherer band is a stable, moral, democratic community where decisions are being made by the whole group, where you kind of know if you're growing up in this, in this band, you are at some point going to be responsible for making decisions. You're growing up with a sense of responsibility, not just for myself, but responsibility for the community that I'm part of. And children at Sudbury Valley School, because they're making the rules in the school, they're involved in the judicial system in the school, and they get to know one another very well, are growing up with a sense of caring about the other children in the school and about the school itself. And many of the graduates of the school that I've talked with said that one of the greatest that's one of the greatest lessons that they've learned. And now when they go out as adults in the world, they have this same sense of caring about the world, the larger world, in which they are now citizens. They feel that it's their responsibility, not just to make their own life good, but to try to do things that will help make the life of everybody in the community better. So those are the characteristics that I think that are really important if one wants to design the ideal environment in which children can educate themselves through their own um, self-educative instincts. Now let me, in conclusion, let me just say in G here, this idea that the next civil rights movement, I believe and I hope, is going to be to liberate children from coercive schooling. I've been arguing primarily on the grounds of educational effectiveness, that self-education is more effective. When children are learning things just for tests, just to pass tests, it's shallow learning, it's not meaningful learning, it doesn't last. 
and they're not discovering their own passions and their own interests and all of that. So I've been arguing that education works better when children are responsible for it themselves. You grow up to have a more effective, more meaningful, more productive, more helpful life if you are self-educated in this way than if you've gone through a system of doing things that you have been forced to do. But I want to now conclude with a different kind of argument. And this is the argument, a human rights argument. Children are human beings. All of us, a good portion of our lives, we're children. If we believe in human rights, then we should believe in human, that those human rights should apply to children. If we believe that it's proper and good that people should be able to do and pursue what they want to pursue, we should apply that to children. If we believe in these principles, the principles of democracy, of free association, freedom to choose your own path, freedom to vote on those rules that affect you, then we should apply those to children. We, it doesn't work to simply expect children to be, to be raised in this way that was really developed at a time when the purpose of school was to raise good servants. But now we want to raise our children not to be good servants. We want to raise our children to be free and independent and happy beings who are in charge of their own life, who, who can start businesses, who can innovate, who can be creative in the world. It's not going to work to raise them under a system of, sub, of subjugation and then expect them to suddenly become liberated full people. And it's only right and proper if we believe that human beings should be liberated and free. It's only right and proper that children should be too. And so I'm going to conclude with that and thank you very, very much for your kind attention to... <clears throat> Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gray, for a very inspirational uh, talk. And I think uh, many of us would agree, especially in your conclusion, remarks about uh, it speaks out uh, a lot of the parents, I mean, the origin, you know, the, the hint or the niche of, you know, having a kid. When you ask parents in Hong Kong, most of the time, uh, they would say, oh, I want my kids to be happy, healthy, and be able to do what they want to do when they grow up. And I think you spoke really well, you know, about that part. But then one point that uh, throughout the talk that really haunted me is when you talk about when we put our kids in school, it's really we uh, depriving them from uh, free will. Um, and so I think I, as a parent myself, you know, um, it, it kind of, you know, feeling uh, sad to, uh, about that when you think about it. And also, and as, as an educator and practitioner, uh, I think it gives us a lot of um, thought, you know, about this part. Uh, I, I know um, you mentioned about uh, a lot the Sudbury School, and uh, I also know uh, in Hong Kong, there's a group of uh, parents also have uh, started that. And uh, because uh, before the uh, talk, we have received a, uh, a, a list of questions, actually, you know, from uh, the participants here, over 50. So uh, it just caught my attention about there are actually um, two questions. One is related to uh, the play that you mentioned about, uh, about play school. One question was that, uh, is that, um, what would you feel uh, about, you know, changing, about the term play school to be play preschool, kindergarten, and nursery school worldwide in early childhood education and care? Um, yeah, I mean, at minimum, uh, the early education should be play school. Why not call it play school? Um, you know, it used to be in the United States, um, kindergarten was always play. It wasn't necessarily called play school, but what does the word kindergarten come from? It's a garden for children, a garden for children to play in. Uh, over time, kindergarten has become uh, a place in the United States where there's relatively little play, and it's very, very sad. In fact, there's even research showing that even by standard academic testing, there's no value whatsoever in academic training in kindergarten. 
that uh, if you if you have there are studies there are experiments done where you compare well controlled experiments where you compare kindergartens that are just play kids just play in kindergarten versus kindergartens where there's academic teaching of the basic skills underlying reading and arithmetic and so on. Not surprisingly, when you test them at the beginning of first grade, the kids who've had that academic training are better at those tasks in first grade, at the beginning of first grade. By third grade, by second grade, it washes out. By third grade, it's completely washed out and sometimes reversed. Whereas those kids who are just playing in kindergarten are now actually better at reading and arithmetic than those kids who are already being trained at reading and arithmetic back in kindergarten. This whole idea of an early start is, has been disproved in experiment after experiment, and, but nobody pays attention to those experiments. Everybody has this idea, the sooner I start <laughs> training my child, that's going to give my child a head start and they'll get into a great university because I already started teaching them when they were three or four or something. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. And the, the research shows it's not true, so we, and we just ignore the research there. So clearly, early schools should be play schools. Why not call them play schools? I'm arguing that all of schools should be play, right? All of schools should be play. It should be play and exploration, and that play and exploration becomes more and more focused and delivered as children grow older and they begin to plan what it is that they want to learn. It's not always completely play, that's a little bit false, but it's completely self-chosen. And, and to the degree that, that play is defined as something you choose to do, that you want to do, uh, to that degree it continues to be play. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, in, in response to that, I have also had uh, parents ask about, oh, I uh, enroll my children into like some uh, extracurricular activities. And I think like to some parents, you know, uh, they, will, they will argue, okay, those are also play for them. How, how, how would you respond to those parents? Yes, well, in my talk uh, tomorrow, which is the public talk, I'll be talking, the title of the talk, uh, talk is, What Exactly is Play? And just as a little prelude to that, the very first defining characteristic of play is that it's something that's self-chosen and self-directed. Mm -hmm. If it's directed by somebody else, it's not play. And what children learn in play, one of the primary lear things they're learning in play is how to, how to choose their own activities and how to direct their own activities. Mm -hmm. And when they're playing with other children, they're learning how to negotiate the differences with other children. So I want to play this, and you want to play that. So we have to talk it out and right. figure it out. If there's some adult here doing that for us, we're not learning how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. The adult is telling us how to do it. And so the, the, the key thing, many of the key things that children are learning in play are taken away when it's, when it's an adult-directed activity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I know we have some time here, and I want to go through like one or two more questions from the list, and then we can go to the floor and see if they have any questions to ask. And then another question uh, is about um, the, uh, you, you talked about a lot like the uh, Sudbury School, and then here uh, there's one question about, okay, um, how do we uh, do that in an uh, urban uh, city? Like, how do we apply that concept in, uh, like, an urban city like Hong Kong? Well, well, that's a good question. As I mentioned, Sudbury Valley itself is not in an urban setting, it, and so it has fields, and there's a woods nearby, and there's a pond, and that's very, very nice. But there are many Sudbury model schools that are in the middle of cities. So there's one in Jerusalem, for example, which has been in existence for a long time, a very successful school. There are schools modeled after Sudbury Valley in Philadelphia and other cities. And so they don't have the advantage in that sense, but they still have, they have uh, freedom of movement, they mo make use of city parks. Um, it means that there has to be a little bit more care. Typically an adult has to go out with them when they're going out to play in the park. But the same principles arrive. There's all kinds of things to do within the building and there are maybe scheduled things where you're outside of the building and playing in the park. 
there's, um, the evidence is that this, you know, it's, there, are, there are both advantages and disadvantages of being in a city versus being in a more suburban or, or um, rural setting. The disadvantage of being in a city is you don't have so, so much outdoor space for playing. The advantage is there's sort of more cultural activities. There's more, there's, there's more things you could do within the city. Even when, when my, one, I didn't mention that one of the things that got me interested in Sudbury Valley was my own son rebelled in public school. And so I couldn't find any place else for him to go that he was willing to go. So we went to Sudbury Valley. That's when I began to do my study. I was worried about whether he would graduate. Well, my son actually is a city person, and he took advantage of the fact that he could leave campus to go into Boston. Mm. And he spent a lot of time in museums, even as a, like 11, 12 years old, he would spend a lot of time in the city. So. There are things that you can do in a city that you can't do in the country. Mm, thanks. This follow with another question that's asked about uh, nature. Uh, it asks about uh, whether, like, just the uh, not like you know, literally leaving the child in the nature, but like uh, playing in the na nature. You know, how is it gonna help a child? How how playing in nature helps a child? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that. You know, there are people who argue that playing in nature is especially important, and I do think it's important. I think it's important partly because uh, altogether too often as a society and our whole world, we're forgetting about nature. We're forgetting about the fact that we live in a, in a world of other animals and plants and where things could shift in a way that makes it really bad for us. We, lose the, the, the joy of nature. I, I think that, to me, in terms of the child's education, I think it's valuable that they're out in nature. I don't think that children are necessarily driven to nature. I think what children are driven to is other children. They want to play with other children. And if there are other children to play with outdoors, then they'll play outdoors. Right. If there's not other children to play with outdoors, they'll play on their computer because the computer then is the only place where they can make contact with other children mm -hmm. and they can have adventures and so on and so forth. So I do think it's valuable to play outdoors because of the physical exercise that you're getting. And I also think it's valuable to play in a natural environment because I do think that it's in the long run important for our planet. <laughs> That we, the more of us grow up with an appreciation of, of nature, and so we're more inclined to try to preserve the natural world. Hmm. Thank you. And I think uh, one more question that I would like to uh, highlight uh, related to education. Uh, some of the educators uh, ask about, you know, how um, these. Um, a free play would be able to help, uh, I mean, uh, any differences, you know, when we use this, you know, in the education uh, uh, context, you know, with special uh, needs children, especially autism. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Um, autism, um, you know, there are, there are some children for whom I would not recommend a, a pure Sudbury model of education. Now, there are some children I've seen who are, have what's called Asperger's syndrome. They're on the autism spectrum mm. who do very well in a Sudbury school. And in fact, I think it's good for them because they are drawn out by the other kids. They become more sociable. One of the characteristics of autism is that you don't make connections with other people very easily. And if you are so far out on that spectrum that you just really have no interest in other people, you just don't make those connections so far out that you don't even learn language because you're not attuned to the language that other people are using, then I think you need special education. You need somebody who really knows how to work with somebody who has that degree of autism. But there are some kids who get diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. So in pre past years would have just been regarded as a little quirky. <laughs> they wouldn't have been given a label. There are just some people that were all different in some ways, and there would have been past recognition of that. 
those kids, I've seen at Sudbury schools, doing okay. They do, you know, they're, oftentimes they're very drawn to computers and they're very good at computers very often. And because they're good at computers, the other kids come around them and they want to learn computers from them or talk computers from them. And as a result of that, they get drawn out of their shell in a way and they begin to talk with other kids and develop social relationships. And maybe they even get drawn outside by some kids, especially little kids will get, say, you know, come out and give me a piggyback ride. And they'll begin to interact socially in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. This is one of the ways in which age mixing plays a really valuable role. For people, whether it's because of autism or because of any other reason, who have some kind of social limitations. They aren't so good at knowing how to get along with the people. Little kids can really draw you out. <laughs> and so, um, and I've seen cases of that where kids who come who are very socially inhibited, the little kids want to play with them and they're just delighted to be playing with these bigger kids. And then that gives you a feeling that, oh, I really enjoy playing with this little kid. And then you begin to sort of work your way up and playing even with kids who are closer to your own age. Thank you so much. Well, before I uh, turn to the audience for questions, I know a lot of us uh, uh, come to the um, education fast, also interested in uh, learning more about uh, alternative uh, education. And I know there's a group of uh, parents in Hong Kong has also started uh, Sudbury School. Uh, I know they have also uh, prepared some questions to ask. Uh, maybe I turn uh, to them for uh, a question or two and uh, before uh, we turn to the audience for the other questions. That, that you're saying that we should do uh, to educate children, or, or rather than educate themselves, um, is uh, conducive to the Sudbury method. So what are you saying basically that Sudbury is the only way to go? Um, or that there's some way that we can uh, change the current schooling systems? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that, um, that um, so Sudbury, I, I, I present Sudbury Valley as, in my opinion, the ideal. I think that this is a situation that has all of those characteristics that I just described. I think that it's very difficult to develop a compromise. And the reason it's difficult to develop a compromise, I mean, this is what the history of education, at least in the United States, is this. So we've got these standard schools, and there's a period of time when people want to make them more progressive. You want to have a little more choice, a little more freedom in the school, more play in the school. But you're still testing the children. <laughs> you're still testing them, and you're expecting them to pass the test. Well, you find that you give them more time to play, and they're learning a lot of stuff, but they're not necessarily learning the stuff on the test, <laughs> right? And if you think passing those tests is important, then you're sort of now going to be a force that says, hey, wait a minute, test scores are going down. Some kids aren't learning how to read until later on. We've got to start pushing the pendulum back this way. So I think it's difficult to compromise. I think unless you give up the idea that you're testing children all along the way, then it's hard to give up the rest. <laughs> the whole age segregation is partly based on testing. Everybody's supposed to be learning first grade stuff in first grade, second grade stuff in second grade. It's an assembly line process. So testing is what drives the rest of it. And so the first and most difficult decision that people have to make if they want really self-directed education is I'm not going to test the children. I'm going to trust them. I'm going to recognize that different children learn different things, and that's good, and that different children learn at different rates. And even when you're learning the same thing, you learn it in different ways and at different times. It's a statement of we value diversity. <laughs> We value and we trust that people are going to turn out okay. If we're going to believe that we have to test the children and if they don't pass the test, that we decide are the tests they should pass, then our system hasn't worked. If that's, if that's what we have, then I think that 
I think that we're just stuck in that pendulum. So I think it is hard. Now, here's what I would say about, um, here is a way to compromise, though. You know, when I, was a, when I was a child in the 1950s in the United States, I had two educations. I had school, and I also had what I call a hunter-gatherer education. And the reason I had both educations is because school didn't take that much of my time. So the school year was much shorter than it is now. The school day was shorter. There was no homework, certainly not in elementary school. There was a little bit of homework in high school. So kids were free to play and explore in age-mixed groups, <laughs> away from adults, all the time they weren't in school. After school, during the summer, during, you know, during weekends. So more of my time was spent in hunter-gatherer education, out there with other kids, doing stuff in our own initiative, fishing, doing all kinds of things, getting into trouble, figuring out our way out of trouble, getting into fights and getting out of fights, doing all the things that kids do that they learn from. We had at least, we had more than half of our lives to do that. So here's what I think, if one is not ready to do away with schools as we know them, let's reduce them. <laughs> Instead of continuously expand them, let's shrink them. Let's not have our children spend so many hours at school. Let's not give them homework. Let's not send them to tutoring lessons after school. Let's not put them into adult-directed activities after school. Let's create opportunities for them to play and explore in their own ways with other children when they're not in school. And that would go a long way towards making children happier, towards giving them time to discover their passions. Basically, all these things that I said happen at Sudbury Valley School could happen outside of school if we gave children the time and opportunity for it to happen. And uh, Peter, if you wouldn't mind me putting in a little plug. <laughs> if anybody's interested in getting involved in starting a Sudbury School, uh, we're in the process of that and we're just trying to gain interest and people that have the skills, you know, such as like setting up a website, stuff like that. If you are interested, please uh, come and speak with us after the talk. We'd really enjoy that. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now let's see if uh, other audience have any questions. Please. Uh, excuse me, I'm also part of the Sudbury Hong Kong team. I hope you don't mind this question. But uh, in our discussions, we have, we have read, I believe, that sometimes older children who have attended a tradi traditional school and are then taken out and put into an alternative school situation such as Sudbury have a difficult time adjusting. Uh, do you have any ideas uh, that you can give us that, to help us integrate children who are in such a situation? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, when a school has been well established, as Sudbury Valley has been, any given year, a certain number of kids can come as older children, a certain number of teenagers can come and be absorbed into the school quite easily. And the reason they're absorbed into the school quite easily is they see an ongoing culture. They see what other children are doing, what other people are doing. There, there are sort of two problems that arise sometimes with somebody who's coming as a teenager to a Sudbury school. One problem is that some of them are, pe are kids who believe that they can just do whatever they want. They say, this is a school where I can do whatever I want. And so they start using alcohol campus or using illegal drugs or they break rules and what's interesting to observe is once the school is established as a culture their peers the other children the other students the other teenagers are telling them, no you can't do that here that's against the rule moreover you know the town might close the school down if they discovered that illegal substances were being used on this campus so that's one kind of a problem the other kind of a problem which is a very different kind of a problem, is sometimes students will come as teenagers and they just are burned out. They're just really, they're depressed or they're burned out and they come to the school and they just sit there looking like they're not doing anything. And so you think the school is failing for them. They're not doing anything. But what the, the staff members at Sudbury 
Valley have learned is that the best thing to do in that case is just let them not do anything. Just let them not do anything until they can't stand not doing anything anymore. <laughs> you know, that they may complain about how bored they are. There's nothing to do here. They're almost begging you to tell them what to do, right? And Danny Greenberg, who's the founder of the school, one of his favorite phrases is, boredom stirs the soul. It, boredom is, let people be bored <laughs> until they can't stand being bored anymore, and then they begin to do something. The other thing that helps for teenagers of that category, again, is the presence of little children. It's hard to be cynical about life when there's little kids running around, happy, <laughs> asking you to give them a piggyback ride, asking you to read a story to them. You know, the little kids kind of boost your spirit up. So for those kids who are coming kind of feeling depressed and cynical, they've been burned out by school and they're carrying that cynicism into the school, the little kids are really the primary help in getting them out of that. And the older kids are the primary help in, in for those kids who come believing that they can break the rules. The older kids are telling them, no, you can't do that. So I think that sometimes it's hard. I think sometimes when first starting a school, I know that some schools have learned this lesson, it's often better to start with little kids <laughs> and then build the culture because little kids, it's, little kids get it more easily in a way. <laughs> they, they naturally know how to play and explore and they, it hasn't been drilled out of them. And then as they get older, now you can begin to bring big kids into the school and now they've got peers, the big kids have peers who have been there long enough that they know how to get things started and they also know that you do have to follow the rules. They're democratically made rules and if you don't like a rule, you can always argue against it and try to get it voted out at the school meeting. But if it's a rule, you've got to follow it. I thought there was a night. Hello? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for that very informative talk. Um, I'm a mother of two, and I'm also the founder of Blooming Buds Preschool. And the reason I founded the school was because I was against schooling. So it sounds all very counterproductive. But um, I do believe in what you mentioned about the conditions and the environment and whatnot, and it does seem to work quite well for certain things. However, on the flip side of things, I'm curious about the literacy element of it, um, especially here in Hong Kong where I guess a lot of us parents are really worried about where our kids go next. Um, and then for primary schools, there are certain expectations. So for the Sudbury Valley, right? Sud Sudbury Valley School, um, how do the children there attain like their literacy skills? How do they what? Attain, attain, attain their, their literacy, literacy skills? Their literacy skills. How do they attain literacy yeah. skills? How do they learn to read and write, you mean? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a very interesting question, and I actually have done some research, kind of somewhat informal research on that. Um, uh, some years ago, a couple of my undergraduate students got interested in the question, how do children learn to read at Sudbury Valley? And so what they did is they identified students at the school who had come to the school not able to read and who now could read. And they... Um, interviewed those kids and they also interviewed the kids' parents and they interviewed the staff members at the school to develop a set of case histories of how different children learn to read. Um, later on I did a study, also, a, sort of a survey study of um, unschooling families, families that are homeschooling but they don't teach the children in any formal way. The children learn in their own ways and I did a study of learning to read again by interviewing parents, um, surveying parents about their children's learning to read. And here's, here are the basic things I learned in both of those studies. Number one is I have yet to find any student who's gone to a Sudbury school, certainly not Sudbury Valley school, or who's been in unschooling who didn't learn to read. Everybody learns to read. Including in my study, in my, stu in my first study of graduates at Sudbury Valley, there were two, two former students who told me that they had come to the school at age 15 at different times. By coincidence, they had both come at age 15, unable to read. That they had been passed along in the public school, even though they couldn't read. They'd been given a diagnosis of dyslexia, which became the uh, kind of a excuse for not knowing how to read and they were comfortable with that diagnosis. 
Both of them told me they learned how to read within, being, within a few months of being at the school. And I asked them, how was it that you couldn't learn to read when you were in public school being taught reading and now you're in a situation where they don't even teach reading and you can learn how to read? <laughs> and both of them said, in different ways, they said, because the first time in my life nobody cared if I could read. It didn't, it took the pressure off. <laughs> Their problem was not, I, there probably is such a thing as real dyslexia. But most students, at least in the United States, who get the diagnosis of dyslexia, it's not a brain problem. It's not that they have a brain that makes it impossible for them to read. It's that maybe they have a brain that made it a little harder to learn to read. And because you're in this situation where you're constantly being evaluated about reading, you get very nervous about reading. And you finally develop a block about it. And you just say, I can't do this. <laughs> And then if you get a diagnosis, you're relieved. Ah, there's a reason now why I can't read. I don't have to pretend anymore. But now these kids here, now they're in this situation where they don't have to, they don't have to hide behind that anymore. And they don't have to feel any nervousness about it. And they could, and in fact, both of them did ask for a little bit of help. And they didn't get much help, but they got a little bit of help from staff members, uh, how to sound out words and so on. There's a code here. And they learned how to read very quickly. More generally, what I found about learning to read is that um, there's a wide range of ages. Some kids learn to read, just like there are always kids who learn to read before they ever start school without any instruction. They just pick it up. My own son could read before he was four years old. Nobody taught him to read. I don't know how he learned how to read, but he was around people who read. I was reading all the time. I was a graduate student at the time. And his mother uh, read to him a lot. So he was in that environment. Nobody was trying to teach him. We just suddenly discovered he could read. And there are actually studies of such children. And what's generally found is they're not necessarily high IQ children. They're not necessarily brighter about other things. It's just that for some reason they got really interested in reading. And they more or less taught themselves to read. If somebody who's three years old can do that, it can't be that difficult, right? It can't be that difficult. And the difference is, so some kids get interested when they're three or four, a few kids do. Some kids get interested when they're seven or eight. Some kids, the latest I know, was 14. A kid who didn't learn to read until he was 14, besides those 15-year-olds. The other, you know, but who've been in school, didn't, didn't really get, they were doing other things. They didn't really need reading. But at some point, they decide they need how to read, and they learn very quickly. They learn how to read. How do they learn how to read? They learn how to, many of them don't even know how they learned how to read. In some sense, they learned how to read the same way they learned how to talk. They're simply surrounded by the written word. They're hearing people read things. They're maybe being read to, and they see the words on the page. Pretty soon, lo and behold, they're reading themselves. They're playing, nowadays, they're playing computer games that have words on the screen. Sometimes kids who can't read are playing computer games with kids who can read, and the ones who can read are reading to them. One of the things that's happened in recent years is children are learning to read earlier than they used to be able to read. Why? Because they're all texting one another. They're, they're communicating with the written word. They're picking up reading in the same natural way that we pick up oral language because they're actually communicating right from the beginning with the written word. So the first thing we have to understand, uh, at least with a phonetic language, I have no idea how anybody learns how to read Chinese. But, <laughs> but with, a, with a language like English, where it's a phonetic language and there's a certain number of letters, it's not very difficult. There's just a little code there. In, the hard thing is learning language, but everybody learns language. By the time you're two or three, <laughs> you've learned the hard thing. Now it's just a matter of mapping that onto the visual page, and that turns out to be pretty easy. We make it hard in school by breaking it down into step-by-step -step little processes. You have to do this, and then you have to do that. And by making children do it in a context in which they're not really very interested in it. They're being forced to do it, and that makes it hard. But when we let children just learn it when they are ready to learn it and want to learn it, they learn it very readily and easily. And writing the same thing, these days, of course, it's not writing, it's typing. Nobody writes anymore. So it's typing on the computer, typing on your iPhone. Kids are just picking that up, and they are learning to spell because the spell checker corrects them every time they make a mistake. So writing is easy. And sometimes we think about, well, how do they learn grammar? 
You don't learn grammar in school. You learn grammar, the, the use of grammar, the proper use of grammar you learn because you hear it. If you, you learn the grammar of the language that you learn. It doesn't even matter whether you know the difference between a verb and a noun. Every child by the age of three uses nouns and verbs properly as nouns and verbs. It doesn't matter if they know how to name them. It might be that if you want to take a, a test for getting into college where you can diagram a sentence, then you learn how to do that, but you learn how to do it just for that purpose. There's no reason you need to know it for any other life purpose. Thank you, Professor Gray. I think uh, our time uh, is really short. Maybe we have one more question. Hello, hello. <coughs> Hi, Dr. Gray. Thank you for coming. Um, I, so we now know your stance on um, public or traditional education versus uh, something like uh, a democratic school. Um, but what do you think about the other, the other alternatives? So, uh, for example, uh, there's a growing movement of uh, ward of education in Hong Kong, which, um, uh, at least for the early childhood, they propose to hide things from children. So, for example, before seven years old, you're not supposed to teach them how to read, and you're not supposed to teach them how to write. So they, they, they hide things from the children on purpose. So it's like the other spectrum of, uh, of schooling. You know, most of Hong Kong is like, oh, let's push, push, push. Let's let, let, let's let them learn really fast, really early. But then here is the other, is the other side. Let's hide things from them. Let's not teach them. What do you think about that? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed some of that. So what? What is the essence of the of this of this kind of schooling that you're describing? Um, I, well, the essence. Uh, I think he was um, trying to uh, ask about uh, there's another alternative uh, education called Waldorf. If oh, you Waldorf, Waldorf education. And okay. uh, yeah, they yeah, yeah, pur yeah purposely uh, trying to maybe uh, right. think that if a child not you know, not necessarily reaching that certain age, you shouldn't right. be teaching them how to write or uh, teaching them how to uh, read. So he is uh, thinking about like, how how you think about that. Right. Yeah. I mean Waldorf education. Um, I have, n I have never directly observed a Waldorf school. I've talked to Waldorf teachers, I've read about Waldorf, I've talked to people who formerly had their child in the Waldorf school. Um, I guess, I guess in, in some ways, I think about Waldorf the same way I think about Montessori schools. There's more recognition that children need to be doing things other than what we think of as just pure academic things and that child development involves uh, these other activities. But I think that in very, in, that both with Waldorf and Montessori and some of the other methodologies, there, there's, especially with Waldorf, it's a little bit stuck in time. That the idea that children should be playing with wooden blocks and not be playing with computers, right? Um, because that's what children used to do. <laughs> Um, I knew one parent who was a, uh, who, who was a uh, Waldorf parent. They, they had their children in a Waldorf school, and they were really fully into Waldorf. And one of the at parts of being in Waldorf was that the children should be playing with wooden blocks and these old-fashioned toys, and they should not be using computers. So she didn't buy her child a computer. The child was maybe eight years old or nine years old. And then the child had a terrible bicycle accident, almost died. He was in the hospital, and he had to be in the hospital for a long period of time. And they took pity on the child, and they bought him a computer <laughs> so he could play with the computer. And the child, his first words was, oh, it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth almost dying so I could get this computer. And and that was when this mother decided Waldorf is stuck in the past. <laughs> so that's a little bit. And the other thing I think about Waldorf is it's almost like, and maybe this is, maybe I'm exaggerating, and maybe this is not quite true, but it's almost like they discourage a child from learning to read. <laughs> you know, it's almost like it's wrong to learn to read. 
And why stop? Why, why the child who's four years old wants to read, who's really interested in reading, why would you prevent the child from reading? So my belief is that whatever the child wants to do at whatever age they want to do it, they know best what they want to do. And they're going to learn best doing what they want to do. So the child who wants to play with blocks should play with blocks. The child who wants to play with a computer should play with a computer. And ultimately, children like to do a variety of things if they're free to do it, and to do it in their own ways. And most children are going to do a variety of different things. I just think, I, I think that the basic thing that we have to get over is our belief that we need to control what our children are learning from and how they're learning. That every child is different, and we can't get into the child's head and make that decision for the child. Only the child can make the decision what they're ready for. And, and throughout history, children, throughout most of human history, children have made their own decisions about what to learn and how to do it. And so biologically, they're good at it. But they're, nobody's good at making that decision for somebody else. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. OK, that's fine. Uh, sorry, I have one um, question regarding this kind of democracy at this um, young age. Do you see a risk there? Yes. Yes, how does the democracy work at such a young age? Yeah, especially when their personal values may not tie to the um, social values. Do you see a risk there, letting them, letting them choose at that young age? OK, yeah, no, I think that, I mean, even infants choose, you know, yeah, yeah. in terms of their own choices of what to learn. There's two aspects to this process of democracy. Part of it is the freedom to make your own choices about what you're doing and what you're learning. And I think everybody knows best. You know, one of the things about play is it becomes boring if you're doing the same thing and you're already good at it. Play, you always move to the cutting edge of your ability. You always go to a higher and higher level because it's no fun anymore if you're just doing something you already can do well. So no matter what children are playing, they're always going to higher and higher levels at what they're playing. And they're also, as I said, when I listed all those different ways that children play, children are motivated. They're motivated internally to play in those ways if they've got lots of time and lots of opportunity to play in those ways. The other aspect of democracy, which I thought you were getting at, and maybe this is, wasn't your question, but I'll answer it anyway, <laughs> is that what about in that democratic meeting where there, people are making decisions about rules, and they're even making decisions at Sudbury Valley, the, the school meeting even decides who are going to be the staff members. They hire and fire the adult staff members. There's no staff member at Sudbury Valley who has tenure. They all have one-year contracts, and to be rehired, you have to be, get a majority vote of all of the members of the school, including the student, including four-year-olds. And so what happens in those meetings, and what I see happening is that the four-year-olds really kind of look to very often to the older people. They're interested and hear, they hear all the arguments. They don't do as much debating. They learn to debate as they go on. But the four-year-olds, first of all, are even less likely to come to the meeting. They're not more, but if they come to the meeting, they're more likely to listen. And they're learning a lot as they're listening. But not surprisingly, most of the arguments, most of the debate is, among, is being presented by the older children and by the staff members, who are, the, after all, the wiser members of the community. And they are more influential in the end in the, in the school meeting. But still, they've got to convince everybody else. And I think that's very healthy, that everybody needs to be, I might believe, I might be a staff member, and I believe that we should have a rule that if you take out some toys, you have to put them away. And I will argue that it's really important to put them away. But in, in, unless I can convince the majority of students that that's a decent rule, that rule won't pass. So I have to be able to explain why this is a rule that would benefit everybody. So that's the, that's the way the democracy works.